back like we never left. It's Double Move Sports. As always, I'm Steph Albiero, and I'm here with the only other person nerdy enough to talk fantasy football with me every single day. It's Alex Lott. Say what's up to the people. Look, I mean, there's probably a lot of people out there that are nerdy enough to talk fantasy football every single day, but I might be the only one that's willing to do it with you, Steph. Some of your takes are pretty questionable. Um, I, I think we're going to have Whoa. some you know, heated debates over time. I know we already have off the air, and we're actually bringing some of those to the show today. So maybe I'm the only one willing to do it with you. Um, but you know, after today's show, uh, maybe some people will be willing to jump in um, and help us debate these topics, help us um, get clarity on who's right and who's wrong between me and you, even though we're probably not going to know till the end of the season. So super hyped for today's show. Uh, bold predictions episode. I, I can't wait to get into some of these takes. We're going to get into some of the names like Terry McLaurin, Mark Ingram, Calvin Ridley, and many, many more. But guys, if you want to go see where we disagree on a lot of these players and just take a look at our rankings. They are now updated and live on our website, doublemovesports.com. You can see our full rankings for every single position. Now, contrary to those rankings today, we're getting into some bold predictions. So you usually in our projections, we like to look at the most likely or probabilistic scenario and our bold predictions here. Now we're just throwing out hot takes, things that we think could happen things that are in the range of outcomes for different players, maybe talking about a ceiling or a floor for them. And Alex, anything else to add here before we jump into it? No, I think you nailed it. I just want to reiterate, we are not projecting these things to happen, but this is kind of us calling our shot saying, I don't like this player or I do like this player and I see an incredibly high ceiling or an incredibly low floor. And we want to put it out there so that you guys have an idea of like what is in the realm of possibility for these guys. So I'm super hyped to get into it. And Steph, if you're ready for me, I'm going to go out, go ahead and uh, throw out my first bold prediction. You ready? Let's hop into it. All right, Steph. This one actually pains me a little bit. I live in Baltimore. I love the Ravens, love Lamar Jackson. I actually like this guy as a player and a personality a lot. But Steph, Mark Ingram is not going to be a top 30 running back in PPR Whoa. formats this season. He is not in the top 30. And I know that sounds like a hot take to some because Ingram was running back 11 in PPR last year. Um, he had over 1,000 yards, 10 rushing touchdowns, added five more touchdowns of uh, receiving. But look, to me, that season he had in 2019 was great. But that is like his absolute ceiling. I, I don't think he's he should have come anywhere close to that last year. And I think this year there are even more signs to say he's probably not getting anywhere close. And by that, I mean top 30 level of close. Um, to wow. that in 2020. So first things first, we'll talk about this Ravens offense. I know it's an elite offense. We're expecting a lot of things from them again in 2020. But their, their season last year was just absolutely historical. They had the most rushing yards in a season of any team ever. And I expect a lot from Lamar Jackson. I expect a lot from the running backs there. I think the running game is what they want to do. I think they, you know, if I was a betting man, I'd bet on them to lead the NFL in rushing yards again. Uh, in 2020, but to expect them to match or beat the record they set last season is not really, you know, a reasonable expectation. I think there's a chance they're close. I think maybe they come within 5%, within 10% of that, which would be a great they season. They got Lamar Jackson, man. They do, and the, and the sky's the limit for Lamar, but I think if they come within 5%, 10% of the rushing yards they had last year as a team, that is going to be a remarkable year for them in 2020. So, First things first, I just expect that overall rushing yardage volume to come down ever so slightly, which just is one um, hit to Mark Ingram in, in this case. So next, let's just talk about more of Mark Ingram as a player and what I expect uh, of his role this season. And, and the first thing here, and this popped off the page at me, Steph, I had to fact check myself several times. What percentage of snaps do you think Mark Ingram played last year? Well, I know he is their main pass pro running back that they have out there in passing downs and he got the the line share the carry so i'll say something like 65 70 percent just a little bit high there steph i'll give it away mark ingram played 48 percent of snaps in 2019 48 percent not even half Dang. he played a a lower snap percentage than carlos hyde royce freeman and the intern patrick laird which is insane <laughs> like I know the narrative that's saying, oh, he's going to get more snaps than that is like they blew teams out and Gus Edwards was out there, you know, running out the clock. But if they're blowing teams out, that is a game script dream 
for a running back like Mark Ingram. He should have been on the field all the time, getting all sorts of volume, you know, r- milking this clock out, protecting those leads. And the fact that he only played 48% of snaps in 2019 is very concerning for me because when I look to 2020, the Ravens are are definitely going to trail more in 2020. This is another incredible stat about the Ravens season. They only trailed for an average of eight minutes and 44 seconds per game <laughs> in 2019. That was number one in the NFL by over three minutes per game. So they played with a lead pretty much the entire game. No reason for Mark Ingram not to be on the field early and often. I think there will be times this season where they're in more passing situations. Maybe they're coming from behind. I think that's going to lead to more snaps for Justice Hill and less snaps for Mark Ingram because Justice Hill is um, that lead receiving back in Baltimore. And look, I don't want to knock Ingram for his age. I know that's like the popular thing to say. He's going to turn 31 this season. He is on the wrong side of 30 at the running back position, but we see it, you know, with guys like Adrian Peterson, Frank, or some guys are um, superheroes and can play into their 30s at the running back position. And Ingram was great last year, so I'm not going to necessarily use that against him, but it's definitely not a case for him. Um, and then when I look at the, the backfield, it's like they brought back Gus Edwards. Justice Hill is still there. And they brought in yep. J.K. Dobbins in the second round of the draft. They, they spent a second-round pick on one of the top running backs in the class, and it's not for him to sit on the bench. I know Ingram's contract – Um, The the Ravens have an out after the season, so maybe they're thinking forward. But they didn't draft uh, uh, J.K. Dobbins with that draft capital to let him ride the bench for his entire rookie season. Steph, what do you think about J.K. Dobbins? I know the popular narrative is like, oh, you know, Mark Ingram's going to get, I don't know, like 70% of the work and and J.K. Dobbins will get 30%. How do you see that shaking out? Yeah, I I think Dobbins will slowly get worked in. Uh, I I took some volume away from Gus Edwards a little bit from Ingram and then pretty much took everything away on the ground from Justice Hill. So I think Dobbins will slowly work his way in. I think he's a a back half of the season if we're just talking 2020 redraft. Love him in a dynasty, especially for next year, even though I think it's actually a very high possibility that, you know, should the Ravens go on a playoff run, Ingram's back and he's he's right in that same role that he's been in. Uh, But I I do really like Dobbins a lot. He's he's a dynasty, you know, goldmine point being like even if he does get slowly worked in throughout the season it's it's not great for Mark Ingram that they have Gus Edwards who they brought back as a free agent draft J.K. Dobbins I still have he was Justice efficient Hill. too yeah it's it's just a really crowded backfield there and I think Ingram will make the most of his touches I think he scores six seven touchdowns I think he gets 800 900 yards uh, but but that just concerns me in that backfield I definitely have him with less touches in 2020 and one last thing I want to talk about with Ingram something that inflated his finish in 2019 that people aren't really talking about is the receiving efficiency so Mark Ingram scored five receiving yeah. touchdowns on only 26 receptions in 2019 that's one of every five receptions going for a touchdown I looked at the <laughs> first eight years of Mark Ingram's career in New Orleans And in the first eight years, he had five total receiving touchdowns, which matches what he had last season. The first eight years, those those five touchdowns were on 226 receptions. So instead of one of every five going for a touchdown, one of every 45 catches went for a touchdown. And if he stayed with that kind of like career efficiency with his um, touchdown percentage last season, on 26 catches, he would have had zero or one receiving touchdown. So you know, the the receiving efficiency is something Ingram historically has not been great at. I mean, he's been an adequate pass catcher, but the touchdown rate was just through the roof. And I know the popular counter argument here is like, oh, but it's the Ravens and it's Lamar Jackson. And that's why, you know, Lamar loves dumping to the running back and their scoring yeah. opportunities and all that stuff. But look, Mark Ingram played on the Saints for the first eight years of his career. He played with Drew Brees, Hall of Fame quarterback, who we all know loves throwing the ball to the running back position. So I'm not buying that counter argument that that like the Ravens um, running back receiving work is suddenly more valuable than the Saints. And he's going to split those targets with with Justice Hill and with J.K. Dobbins this year, just like in New Orleans. He split with Alvin Kamara back in the day was splitting it with guys like Peter Thomas, Darren Sproles. Like that's not going to change. So the, the offense move for Ingram is like a lateral move. And just looking at what he's done efficiency wise through the air and volume wise through the air in his career, doesn't add up to another season like that in 2020. And I actually expect that 26 reception number to come down a little bit. He's definitely not scoring five touchdowns. Maybe he gets one. I think I have him statted out for one. Um, But that's just another chink in the armor. Like that could be four or five less touchdowns. That doesn't even count what he's doing on the ground. Okay. All right. Look, look, I, 
I get that it's a bold predictions episode, but you have Ingram in your rankings at the RB33. I've been <laughs> mine at the RB20. And I think most people are on my side. We put out a poll on Twitter. We were having a heated debate earlier this week about where Mark Ingram finishes. It got 231 votes. I'll have that poll up on the screen. And 60% of the votes said Ingram is in the top 24 next year. So in terms of a consensus, most people have him, you know, at least as an RB2. And look, I, I, I'm going to make my case for Ingram here. He's he's the one from a contract standpoint, veteran leadership standpoint, a production standpoint. He's been highly efficient pretty much his entire career. His, his nine-year career, he's at 4.6 yards per attempt. And he's consistently producing the NFL while getting less than 14 carries a game. He's never been like a full, you know, 16, 17, 18 carry a game workhorse. He was at five yards a carry last year on just uh, on 202 at, at rushing attempts. You mentioned the five touchdowns through the air. Yeah, I could see that coming down. But when I'm watching the Ravens on film, one thing I'm seeing is that the Ravens want Ingram out there to pass block. And when defenses don't blitz, that's a perfect time for Ingram to get into check down mode. And they're expecting Lamar to run. So you think of a, you know, a pass rusher gets behind the line. Now they have to make a decision in split seconds. Do I go after Lamar, who's going to take off with the ball, who's an electric runner? Or am I going to go after Ingram, who most of the time is going to end up being wide open in the flats with an almost free trip to the end zone? So I don't necessarily like see a complete drop off of that receiving efficiency. I don't think they let J.K. Dobbins get into the game for pass protection. So look, give me the RB1 and the best rushing offense in the league. We see... You know, teams with mobile quarterbacks usually have good running backs as well. So, look, Ingram's not a sexy name, and I don't think he's an RB1 next year. I have him in my rankings, like I said, at RB20, but Ingram is just cut from the same cloth as guys like Jarvis Landry. You mentioned Frank Gore, who are just these, these yearly fantasy producers that aren't sexy picks, but they're historically great over their entire careers, which are typically longer careers. So <laughs> I haven't seen a real reason to expect Ingram's performance to, to take a massive decline. There's more evidence to me that the opposite's true. And we should certainly expect Ingram to outperform his current ADP, which is the RB27 per Fantasy Pro's expert consensus rankings for 2020. Yes, he hurt his calf at the end of last year, but he's had plenty of time to have that healed and rehabbed. He's been RB1 four out of the last five seasons. So I just, it's really hard for me to, to look at all of those numbers and, and all the production he's had up to this point in his career and just say he's going to fall off completely. But uh, I, I was pretty floored by that snap share uh, number. We'll see. We'll see how this pans out. I don't think we're either of us are going to come to an agreement. This is one that's been a heated debate that I'm sure we're going to continue to have uh, all the way up until draft day. Yeah, Steph, I've made my case, and I think this is going to be one of those situations where we agree to disagree. And look, you can have all the Ingram you want, and that's just going to give me value on my guys you know, in that fifth, sixth round. So you can have them. I, you can have them. It's absolutely fine. But um, it'll be fun to watch the Ravens this year for sure. All right, so now to get into my first bold prediction, which is Calvin Ridley finishes as a top seven wide receiver Whoa. in 2020. Calvin Ridley's 25 years old, finishes the wide receiver two last year, only playing in 13 games. And listen to this, last year, Calvin Ridley had the second highest DVOA of all wide receivers. So that is a stat from Football Outsiders, which essentially stands for the Defense Adjusted Value Over Average. So now that's a lot to, to take in there. But essentially what this metric does is measures a player's efficiency while waiting in the defense and all the other players that have been in that exact situ same situation. And Ridley was second amongst wide receivers in the NFL. Even taking a step further, looking at reception perception. Calvin Ridley's success rate. This is plays targeted or not where Ridley was able to create separation. And what we mean by separation, there's essentially an arm's length away or more space between his defender. He had a 77.6% success rate versus man, which is the 95th percentile. And he had a 77.6% success rate versus press coverage, which is in the 86th percentile. So this guy's just elite. And what we know about Atlanta is that the pass volume is going to be there. The, the Falcons pass a ton. They led the NFL last year with 684 pass attempts. That's a huge margin of 51 pass attempts between them and the team that finished right behind them at second. And they finished fifth in pass attempts in 2018. When the Falcons defense is, is bad, even though I think it should improve from last year, the Falcons throw a lot because they can uh, with Matt Ryan. So last year, Ridley, 93 targets in 13 games. And Sanu and, and uh, Austin Hooper leave an additional 139 targets available, which is over 20% of this team's targets from last year. So you got to think at least some of that is going to be funneled towards Ridley. We can talk about Hayden Hurst, who, who I love this year as a late tight end option, but there is no guarantee that Hurst is the guy 
or anywhere near what we expect uh, from Hooper. And Hooper was relied upon last year with a lot of guys in and out of the lineup. So there's there's no guarantee that Hurst is just going to be great in the red zone immediately and just carry over what Austin Hooper brought to that offense. And we've only seen him really score three touchdowns in two seasons. A few more points to make here. After Sanu was traded in week seven, here's Ridley's average stat line, 8.2 targets, 5.5 receptions, 82 yards, and a touchdown every other week. So that's an average of 17.7 points a week in PPR leagues. That's a pace for 131 targets, which would have put him at 12 last year. And I'm not saying this will happen, but that's a fantasy points pace to be the wide receiver two uh, in in 2019. So add that in, uh, even more just icing on the cake here. We always joke about how Julio Jones has had issues in the red zone, essentially his whole career. They just can't get him the ball in the end zone. Uh, Ridley eight last year in the red zone. Julio had six touchdowns in 15 games. Ridley had seven touchdowns in 13 games. And then on top of that, you add in Todd Gurley's massive injury risk that could funnel even more targets to Calvin Ridley. So look, I, I think it is very possible in the range of outcomes that, you know, much like a, a Mike Evans, Chris Godwin situation where two receivers are fantastic. I think the same could happen here on the Atlanta Falcons in 2020. And if, if anything happens to Julio Ridley is a plug and play wide receiver one week in week out. I absolutely love him here in 2020. Yes, yeah, Steph. I, I love the case. I mean, I mean, the, the opportunity is there. Like, look, we get it. Several of your points is one, look, the guy's good. <laughs> He's straight up good at football. Two, there's a ton of pass volume on this offense. There's a ton of vacated targets on this offense. So there's even more opportunity for Ridley next season. The, the big question just becomes, like, what is that ceiling with Julio Jones in the offense? I don't think this is the season. I think last year we saw Chris Godwin get to the point where it's like, oh, snap. Like, we don't actually know – who is a better wide receiver or who we'd rather have in fantasy football, Chris Godwin or Mike Evans. A lot of drafts this year, Chris Godwin, even in redraft is going before Mike yeah. Evans. So he got to that point where it's like, okay, this is like mono e mono. These guys are both elite. I don't think any of us are expecting uh, Calvin Ridley to get to that point with Julio Jones. And I know it's one because Julio Jones is a lot better than Mike Evans, but I, I don't, I don't know. I just can't imagine Calvin Ridley being a top seven wide receiver because that means Julio Jones it's a hot take that means Julio Jones is somewhere in the top five and the Falcons are supporting another another top seven guy it's it's out like I think it could happen I love the case you made we saw it in Tampa last year the volume will be there in Atlanta and the quarterback play is much better than it was with Jameis Winston <laughs> so there's a case to be made and if touchdowns do go Ridley's way we saw him have um, a very high touchdown percentage I'll, I'll actually grab that number here um, in a second, we saw him really break out in the touchdown category in his rookie season. So we know he can get it done. He's not going to have that Julio Jones syndrome of not being able to get in the end zone. I definitely am not projecting Calvin Ridley near there. I think, you know, his upside for me is somewhere at that low end wide receiver one, maybe high end wide receiver two range. But but look, he's a talented guy with opportunity. That's the two things we look for. It's a good quarterback and he's still incredibly young, learning from one of the best in Julio Jones. So I'm willing to I'm willing to buy in stuff. I'm willing to say like, hey, I give that, let's say, a uh, 10% chance of happening this year. Not bad. All right. All right. All right. Well, it is a bold predictions episode. And, and just to go back to our projections real quickly here. Uh, I have Ridley in my projections as the wide receiver 20. You have him as the wide receiver 23 in PPR league. So that's our consensus wide receiver 21 there. Uh, I'm feeling pretty good about that. And I, I feel like he's definitely going to outperform that uh, ranking that we have him there at 21. So I may have to move him up a little bit. Yeah, really quickly. I just want to add on to the end of this take Ridley in his rookie season had 10 touchdowns on 64 receptions last year in just 13 games. He had seven touchdowns on 63 receptions. So Ridley has been able to get in the end zone with Matt Ryan. So I definitely don't yeah. expect him to have these Julio Jones like struggles um, with touchdowns and, if, if the volume is similar and the touchdowns are there, I think it could happen for Ridley next season. So I'll go ahead and jump into my next bold prediction. I love this one. I've been all over this guy. I feel like all offseason, so excited about him. And I never expected this because this is a player I did not believe in coming into his rookie year last year. Even when he got the starting job, I'm like, oh, this dude's trash. And just after looking at his film, looking at some of the games he had and seeing that upside... I've slowly but surely become more and more of a Daniel Jones believer. Never thought I'd be saying that. Yes. But my hot take here is that Daniel Jones, our boy Danny Dimes, finishes as a top five 
fantasy quarterback oh. in 2020. Top five. And yes, this is the same league that? that has Lamar Jackson, Patrick <laughs> Mahomes, Prescott, Kyler Murray, uh, and Deshaun Watson. So he's beaten out one of those guys based, based on that math um, and everybody else. Look, Daniel Jones, his upside is through the roof. In 12 games last year, as a rookie, he had 3,000 passing yards and 24 touchdowns. That pace is for 4,000 passing yards and 32 touchdowns. From a pocket Dang. passer perspective, those are the kind of numbers that makes you a QB1. But something people don't realize about Daniel Jones, he actually also provides a really good rushing baseline. He had 279 rushing yards and two rushing touchdowns on the ground in those 12 games in his rookie year. That's more rushing yards per game than Russell Wilson or Dak Prescott last season. Wow. So Daniel Jones is getting it done with his legs. He provides a lot of opportunity on the ground. I think he does get a couple rushing touchdowns to boost that floor. And yes, he has a fumbling problem. He led the NFL in fumbles. I think he does clean that up in year two. There's been a lot of beat reporters this offseason talking about protecting the football, being Daniel Jones' number one priority in the offseason. So I think the sky's the limit for Jones next season. We saw his huge upside as a rookie. Listen to these four stat lines. I know it's only a third of his games, but he finished as a QB1 or QB2 on the week and 33% of his starts as a rookie, which is wow. not too bad. And in week three, he had 336 passing yards, two touchdowns passing, and two touchdowns rushing. Um, in week eight, 322 yards, four touchdowns. Week 10, 308 yards, four touchdowns. Week 16, 352 yards and five touchdowns, zero interceptions in all those weeks as well. So I know the bottom came out a couple weeks for Daniel Jones, but he proved his upside that he can sling the ball and get it done. The Giants last season were 23rd in total yards per game, but they could not keep these playmakers on the field. Right. They bring in a new head coach and Joe Judge. Um, they get some of these guys healthy. You look at Saquon Barkley, he missed two games last year. Sterling Shepard missed six. Evan Ingram missed eight, Golden Tate missed five, and Darius Slayton missed two. He, Daniel Jones is going to have all of these weapons at his disposal next season. I think it's going to be a sleeper, sleeper, scary offense in 2020. And one thing people aren't talking about either is the O-line. They improved the O-line in the offseason, drafted a tackle at four overall, another tackle in the third round, and a guard in the fifth round. So the line is going to be improved. I don't know that the defense is necessarily going to be much better. And the weapons are all going to at least start out the season healthy for the Giants. So keep an eye out for Daniel Jones. Wow, that's I, I'm pumped, man. You got me pumped for Danny Dimes. I think we both love him as a a uh, late redraft quarterback shot that you can grab in your draft. You know, think of the names around his his ADP. Look at like you know Matt Stafford, um, you know Big Ben, guys like that that you're just grabbing late at the end if if you're not grabbing a, a big quarterback name early. And right now we have him. I thought I had a, this was a pretty hot take having him at 11 in my rankings after starting on every team. We have him at the consensus quarterback 10. So you definitely given the double move stamp of approval over to Daniel Jones. I'm excited um, for Danny Dimes in 2020. Yeah, look, Steph, Danny Dimes is one of those guys I'm literally trying to grab everywhere. If I leave a draft without Daniel Jones, <laughs> no matter what the rest of my team looks like, I'm like, Dang, I feel like I really missed an opportunity there. And there's another guy I'm going to talk about later that I feel the same way about. So, Steph, I swear, if you snipe Danny Dimes from me in any of our redraft leagues, I'm going to be so pissed at you. Don't do well, it. Don't do <laughs> it. We'll, we'll see what happens. You know, I, I'm, I'm more of a – I'd rather take the upside, even bigger upside to me from Joe Burrow. Uh, but, no, I, they're all in that tier, man. And even looking a little bit lower than that, like look at Drew Locke. So there's a lot of fun, exciting – young upside quarterbacks to take this year in redraft that's why we're all about late quarterback but i want to get into a guy that i'm not excited about in 2020 and it's david johnson and i i think just like you said ingram's gonna finger finish outside of the top 30 i have david johnson not projected to but i think it's very easy that the wheels could fall off and david johnson finishes outside of the top 30 even top 40 in 2020 right now his adp is the rb20 in ppr and it pains me to make this take as I have DJ to thank for, for a number of fantasy championships, but David Johnson right now in the <laughs> Texans reminds me of the situation, the same one we had with Steve Wilkes just a season before last in 2018 when he was the, the head coach for the Arizona Cardinals. Listen to some of these stats that David Johnson had under Steve Wilkes. He had incredible volume, 258 carries, that's 16 attempts a game. But a disgusting 3.6 yards per attempt, which even last year, we know the wheels came off last year for David Johnson. He was at 3.7 yards per attempt. So even if that improves, you're saying Johnson's going to need to get at least 250 carries 
in this offense to break a thousand yards and then that 250 carries is more than what Carlos Hyde got last year the Texans have the 21st ranked run blocking O-line per football outsiders which is obviously pretty bad and I think a lot of people overvalue age but at 28 years old that's that's the drop-off age for running backs and that's exactly where David Johnson is He's coming off a rough injury history, lower back and ankle injuries, which are both important body parts for running back to stay on his feet and move defenders backwards. And I hate to say it, man, it just DJ looked washed last year, especially when the Cardinals brought Kenyon Drake in and he was fantastic and electric almost right away. And DJ's role in the Texans, like he, he's not a between the tackles guy like Carlos Hyde, who barely broke a thousand yards and finishes the RB 30 last year. Johnson's been a guy who finished, uh, who, who wins out in space. That's essentially what he's done his entire career and where he's made his hay. And Johnson has very much a receiving skill set. So with that, what are the Texans going to do with David Johnson? Use him as a receiving back? I, I don't know. Duke Johnson's there and that's just not what this team does. So in 2019, the Texans had 78 targets to running backs. And that's the fourth fewest pass attempts to the running back position. And if you look back to 2018, they had 62 targets to running backs, which was dead last. So unless the Texans are going to drastically change their playbook this year, I don't see any reason why we should expect David Johnson to have anywhere more than 40 targets. And I think it's realistic for, to see him less than 30 targets. Uh, the real value wow. of this backfield might actually be Duke Johnson. The more I think about it, I might have to dig into that one a little bit more, but I'm out on DJ this year. It saddens me to say it. He just seems to be on the decline and, and I could easily, easily see the wheels falling off for him this season. I don't like that fit in the Texans offense. And I certainly won't have many shares of David Johnson on my teams in 2020. Look, you, you laid out the downside for David Johnson. And I think it's all valid as kind of like a devil's advocate here. I will say with David Johnson, there is this like, upside of the unknown in Houston where it's like what if he comes in and he does get the same workload that he saw in Arizona and he is effective and he does get the receiving work as well and he's like you know this top 12 RB1 again I think that's in the realm of possibility I think there's probably like if I had to put a percentage on it like uh I'm making this up off the top of my head like a 33 percent chance so you know a 33 percent chance he comes in like the world on fire and it's like you know a, a low end RB1 high end RB2 but I think the much more likely scenario is kind of what you laid out. And, and honestly, what's probably going to happen is something in the middle. But I think if you had to pick, is he going to be an RB1 or an RB3 or an RB4? I'm putting my chips on the RB3, RB4 side because of everything you just said. One, there's a lot of unpredictability with a new team. Yeah, I mean... Go ahead. I was going to say, you know, one thing that would change a lot for me is if, if the Texans, whether in camp uh, or if they just come out and say hey, we want to use David Johnson as our wide receiver three or put him somewhere, maybe throw him in the slot a little bit more. Maybe that would like change. Like an Alvin Kamara type. Yeah, yeah, if you, you add some of that in. But then you look at this receiving core and it feels kind of crowded as well with you know, bringing in Randall Cobb, Brandon Cooks, Will Fuller's still there. We'll see if he can stay healthy. Kenny Stills is still there. Kiki QT is still there. So I, I just really don't see why you're going to ask David Johnson to line up in the slot or even the outside uh, when you have all those other receivers there vying for targets. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. And, and the thing is, like, there is that glimmer of hope that he gets back to the David Johnson of old that was an elite fantasy performer Would at love the running to back see position. It. But you just you look at all the variables. Like, I, I wish the best for the guy. And look, I have him in the low 20s, I think, in my ranking. So I am betting on somewhere in the middle there. He's right in that RB2 range. But you just look at, A, you mentioned the injury history. He actually had another pretty gruesome knee injury a couple years ago as well. MCL. So, a guy at his age, at, at 20, 28 years old, who has, you know, ankle, knee, back injuries, he even broke his wrist that one year. Like, that's not good. It, it, you know, <laughs> maybe he gets back to, to almost full speed, but it's not great, right? And then he switches teams to the Texans, not in a lead offensive line. They were bottom half last season in run blocking. That's not good either. And you said it with the pass volume, the Texans. And I know some people are like, oh, saying a team doesn't throw to this position is like overrated. But when you have the same quarterback, like I don't think it's a Texans issue. I don't think it's a coaching staff issue. This is a Deshaun Watson thing. Since Deshaun Watson has been their quarterback, he has not checked it down to the running back position. You laid it out. David Johnson is not going to get this crazy receiving volume. And you mentioned it as well with Duke Johnson. If there is going to be receiving work from the running back position, they literally brought in a pass catching specialist to the running back room last year, and he still only had 62 targets. So no, David Johnson isn't breaking 50, 60 targets this year. I'm definitely not betting on it. Um, and I agree with you, Steph. I think maybe there's this upside and this this dream of like an RB1, but 
I, I'm low on David Johnson. I'm taking a lot of guys at my RB2 that are much safer plays. Like I look at David Montgomery. He's a guy I love there. Even Devin Singletary. Players like that in that RB2 range that are just going to get volume or, and are going to have a much more consistent role that are younger in their career, still improving as players, things like that. I'm investing in those guys rather than a risk like David Johnson. All right, Steph, for my next hot take, it's another guy I love this season. It's Terry McLaurin, and he's grown yes. on me all offseason. And this take is that Terry McLaurin, Scary Terry, finishes as a wide receiver one, so the top 12 in PPR formats this season. I love it. Let's back it up. Last year, Terry McLaurin was the wide receiver 29 in full PPR. He only played 14 games, but he was on a terrible Washington Redskins team. This team was volatile. They fired their head coach halfway through the season. Bill Callahan comes in and, you know, acts like he's trying to get Adrian Peterson like 3,000 yards on his Madden (laughs) franchise. It was as if he just wanted to run the ball every single play, regardless of how much they trailed. Um, Here's a really awesome stat from this Redskins team last year that really lays the blueprint for what they were trying to do. They were dead last in pass yards per game, 175 yards a game. Yikes. They were dead last in scoring offense, only 16 points a game, 26th in pace of play, and 30% of their drives led to three and outs. And like they were that bad in the passing game last season. And They should have had all these pass-heavy game scripts while they were trailing, they were struggling, but yet they still decided to run the ball that much. They spent more time trailing last season than every team in the NFL other than the Jacksonville Jaguars. So I don't expect that to change this year. This team did not get a lot better in the offseason. They're going to be trailing a lot again in 2020. They bring in new head coach Ron Rivera. He's not a moron. If they're behind in games, (laughs) he's going to try to pass the ball with his young quarterback, with his young receiving core, and catch up and develop these guys. So Ron Rivera comes in. He's going to establish a better culture on that team. And I look at this receiver room. There is nobody else. I think the one thing that concerns me the most is like Dwayne Haskins is throwing him the ball. The O-line's not necessarily great, but there should be plenty of volume um, on this offense. Terry McLaurin had a 19.4% target share last season. I expect that to go up. Dwayne Haskins was his college quarterback at Ohio State. McLaurin's the number one option. I know there's a lot of hype around guys like Antonio Gibson Antonio Gandy, Golden, even Kelvin, Kelvin Harmon, Steven Sims are there. But like, come on, what names did I really just mention? Maybe some of those guys <laughs> have upside, but there is no other superstar receiver. Terry McLaurin is there to be a superstar receiver. And I think they're going to try to pass the ball with their young quarterback. So last year he, he showed flashes. He was um, 12th in the NFL in yards per reception, had 93 targets, 58 catches, 919 yards and seven touchdowns. So I think Terry McLaurin's an incredibly talented wide receiver, and I am super, super hyped to see what he can do with a full offseason with Dwayne Haskins, a new head coach, and a more competent offense in 2020. I love it. I'm so in on McLaurin. He's a guy that, you know, we talk about wide receiver position being so deep this year. McLaurin is a guy that if you're loaded up on some of the other positions, why not plug him in as your wide receiver too? I think he has plenty and plenty of upside. And and Dwayne Haskins did have his moments last year. I know the narratives are – you're going against him pretty hard right now, but uh, he, he did have some impressive plays. So who knows, right? We're not going to deal in absolutes and just say Haskins is trash. He's never going to make it. I mean, he was drafted to a team <laughs> he might as a be, starter. But who knows? But we'll, we'll, we'll see. But uh, yeah, I, I think McLaurin could finish very, very high this year. Right now, just in our projections, which, uh, you know, again, are, are not hot takey at all whatsoever. You have him at the wide receiver 16. I have him at the wide receiver 22. Give him a census rank of the wide receiver 20. Again, this is in PPR, but I'm pretty excited for Terry this year and can certainly see him finishing as a wide receiver one. One more thing about Terry last season. I mentioned he was the wide receiver 29 in full PPR. I really think that's his floor. He was a rookie. He only played 14 games last year, and he actually had at least 50 yards in 10 of his 14 games played. And that was with that trash Redskins situation last season. So I think the floor is there for McLaurin. He's going to get the volume. He's elite. And there's nowhere to go but up. There's nowhere to go but up for this for this season for Terry. All right. So my next hot take here, my bold prediction for 2020. It actually may not be that much of a hot take, but based on ADP and where people have him in their rankings, I think it is to some. It's that Aaron Jones finishes at top three again at the running back position in Dude. 2020 fantasy. 
What? So hear me out. Hear Are me out. Are you kidding me? So Jones, Aaron Jones, have you heard of Ezekiel Elliott, <laughs> Saquon Barkley, and Christian McCaffrey? Hey, you even Alvin Kamara. Who's he beating out of those guys? You'll, you'll hear me. You'll hear me out in a second, and you're gonna know <laughs> because I know I'm right. Uh, <laughs> the no, no, no. The biggest thing is gonna be touchdowns, and I want to talk about some of the regression and things like that. But look, Jones finishes the RB two last year, and I'm finding myself falling victim to to being scared away by Aaron Jones, but just by the AJ Dillon pick. But uh, Aaron Jones is a great football player. He's on a team that wants to run the ball. Last season, the Packers defense stepped up to keep games closer. And, and the Packers finished 15th in terms of points scored in a 13-3 and season. I don't see why that's going to change all too much going into 2020. The Green Bay O-line is great. They have everyone returning. They were the fifth best run blocking offensive line per football outsiders. Now, the biggest thing with Jones is the touchdown regression. Everybody loves to talk about it, but... Yeah, I don't think most of us understand all the factors and variables that go into regression. Uh, so I want to use some analysis that some of you may have heard on the show already from our boy Mike Liu over at BDGE's Bunk Bed Breakdowns. Look, I'm not going to say that Jones is going to get 19 total touchdowns again, but I think 13 to 15 is definitely in his wheelhouse. And, and so here's what Mike put together for us. Two, two key components to this regression analysis. The first one is touchdown distribution. So it's looking at, right, where did running a running back get the ball when they scored now, obviously as you get closer to the goal line your odds of scoring go up and then the next one is red zone efficiency so that's looking at conversion rates between uh you know 20 yards to the end zone 10 yards five yards and when we look at jones touchdown distribution that first one there he got 63 percent of his touchdowns inside the 10 and 57 percent of his 19 total touchdowns inside the five so what does that what does that actually mean it means that Aaron Jones touchdowns are, are relatively sticky. You aren't relying on Jones to take a handoff from the 50 yard line all the way to the house, though he, he can do that too. Now, and Jones got 12 rushing touchdowns from within the 10 last year. That's tied for most in the league between Kish, Christian McCaffrey and Todd Gurley. So we can expect Jones to continue to score double digit touchdowns next year, just because he has safe scoring volume. Now, the question is there, does AJ Dillon take goal line carries away from Aaron Jones? Yep, certainly that is in the range of outcomes that he could do that, but there's no guarantee that that happens either. And why would LaFleur take Jones off the field in early downs in the red zone? Maybe I'm missing something, but even if Dylan got gets a free it, Aaron Jones, we've been saying it for years. We really and have. And finally did it. I, I know. And it was fantastic. Maybe I'm missing something, but if Dylan gets two or three touchdowns, that still doesn't scare me away from drafting Aaron Jones all too much, especially with Dylan being a rookie in a shortened off season. And the next thing I want to talk about in terms of that regression is the red zone efficiency. So we know the best comp for a player is not other players. It's actually themselves historically. And, and if we look at the 2017 and 2018 seasons, Aaron Jones was actually converting at 62.5% inside the 10. In 2019, he was 4.5% lower at 58%. So it's not like Jones had some crazy outlier year. He was actually below his career averages in terms of red zone efficiency. And then we look at inside the five, that 58% conversion rate he had there is higher than the 56% average among the top 15 fantasy running backs. When, when Jones is inside the five, he, he's unstoppable. And so to me, there's no guarantee that he, he won't be putting up double digit touchdowns again next year. Matt LaFleur is giving all the scores over to Jones since McCarthy left Green Bay. Jones scored a touchdown last year, every 15 carries. That's far and away the best touchdown rate of the top 15 running backs in the NFL. And he only played on 61% of snaps in 2019. So I, you can make a case to me for why the touchdowns can continue. And then on top of that, Jones quietly gets a lot of passing work. He had 68 targets and 49 receptions last year. I don't think that just totally disappears uh, for Jones either. I don't think they remove him from the passing game completely, even though we got Jamal Williams there too. Um, I still think he's going to get some receiving work. So I think Jones is probably one of those names where you, know, you see him on the draft board and your first inclination is to look at Josh Jacobs, Miles Sanders, and Austin Eckler. But it's totally possible that Jones finishes over all of those names and finishes his top three again here in 2020. Steph, I got to give it to you because I know this is a bold predictions, like hot takes episode. And you could have said Aaron Jones finishes as a top five running back, and I would have given you the same your crazy reaction. And I actually still think it's crazy. So, <laughs> you know, that's absurd. Like, he's not going to be in the top three. But I will say, this is why we do this episode. No, I'm not telling you to draft Aaron Jones as the third running back off the board. But, like, your case you make makes me look at my rankings, and I see Aaron Jones sitting there at 11. 
you know, right in between Miles Sanders and Josh Jacobs. And I'm like, I think maybe I should bump him up a little bit because you're right. The touchdowns historically, he's been very efficient in those areas. I think Aaron Rodgers is going to target Devontae Adams about 10 billion times this year. Um, so, you know, Devontae Adams still is going to get some of those red zone looks from Aaron Rodgers. They bring in Funchess as a red zone target, but maybe that kind of counteracts what they had in Jimmy Graham before. But no, I don't see 19 total touchdowns in the realm of possibility. But right now I have Aaron Jones statted for for way too, too low of touchdowns in my rankings. I, I think I'm I'm buying into that A.J. Dillon hype a little bit. Right now I have Aaron Jones at 11 total touchdowns, and I think I might need to bump that up to, you know, even 12 or 13, just giving him a couple could be valid. Um, it's important to remember that Aaron Jones was incredibly efficient in those situations last season. A.J. Dillon was, what, a fourth-round pick? Or no, he was a second-round second. pick, wasn't yep. he? Back of the yep. second back round. The second. Well, yeah. So, I, I mean, they draft him at the back of the second round, but Jamal Williams' contract is up after the season. I believe maybe Aaron Jones yeah, is as well. Is Don't as well. quote me on that. No, you're right. You're right. But you're absolutely right. Like, maybe A.J. Dillon gets a little bit more workload towards the end of the year, but there's no reason to believe the best running back for the Packers isn't going to be on the field early and often. That receiving floor that he has also – is very appealing and you know i think i need to bump him up a little bit so great case Look, there i am so on the other side of the room <laughs> of you that he has the chance to repeat as a top three running back this season but but look you had some good points i'll give you that look, it's, a, it's a bold predictions episode so i'm bringing him out right now this this actually blew my mind i just had to check the adp right now aaron jones is going off the board of the rb 13 based on fantasy pros expert consensus rankings wow. that is crazy to me espn has him at seven um, which i think is more realistic for where we should have him but uh yeah i, I think the aj Dillon hype is just the, the pendulum has swung too far the other way so look don't sleep on jones in 2019 or <laughs> Sorry, I jumped back a year. Don't sleep on Jones in 2020. Uh, but Alex, let's hear your next bold prediction. Absolutely. This is my last bold prediction of today's show. So I tried to save the best for last for you guys. And this is one of those other guys. I mentioned it with Daniel Jones. If I leave a draft without this guy, I am so upset at myself because I the, the take will speak for itself. Let me just say it. <laughs> Tyler Higby finishes as the tight end one Whoa. in 2020 Whoa. the tight end one will be tyler that's Higby. silly and i know what you're probably thinking you're sitting there you're telling yourself but alex travis kelsey's been the tight end <laughs> one for four straight years and he has patrick mahomes look kelsey's great this is not taking away from kelsey at all this is just the full on full steam ahead tyler higby hype train you're gonna you have know, to make it, an incredible case here we are going full blast like the train's coming. You're either going to get hit or you got to get off the tracks with Tyler Higby. <laughs> so here's my case for Higby. We, I mean, we know what happened last season. He burst onto the scene out of nowhere. But look, Tyler Higby won. People aren't giving him enough credit for just being a good player. He's got a very athletic build. I think he's like 6'6", 250. He actually started his career as a wide receiver, but he quickly outgrew that given the fact he's freaking 6'6", 250. <laughs> Um, so he shifted to tight end, and he consistently has created I, – I was reading through some of his actual scouting reports when he was coming out of Western Kentucky, and time and time again it says he's got a good athletic profile, above-average speed, above-average agility. He's really good at creating separation. He's a nightmare for linebackers. And now at 27 years old, after a couple of years in the league, he finally got to show that last season. So listen to this. 12 personnel is one running back, two wide receivers, and two tight ends. The Rams in weeks one through 12 only ran 12 personnel on 14% of snaps. From weeks 13 Ugh. through 17, that jumped up to 34% of snaps. That is the window we saw Higby break out. So something dramatically changed in this offense. And Sean McVay said, look, I'm going to try something a little bit different. And he tried it and it worked. And he came back to it again and again and again. And we look at what they did this offseason and they trade Brandon Cooks. I know they drafted Van Jefferson, but they trade Brandon Cooks. So this tells me like all these three wide receiver sets, all this, you know, the Rams are going to have three top 24 wide receivers. Those days are over. And that has shifted to a focus on the tight end position. Let me tell you some splits for Tyler Higby, he only played 15 games last year. I'm going to read his first 10 games versus last five games for several different things. First is the snap percentages. In the first 10 games, he only exceeded 60% of snaps three times. In the last five games, he played at least 86% of snaps in each and every game. Those Dang. were those uh, 12 personnel heavy games. He was on the field a ton. Target-wise, in the first 10 games, 
3.3 targets a game. Nasty. In the last five games, 11.2 targets <laughs> per game over a five-game stretch. So they were featuring him in this offense. I loved it. And then from a fantasy scoring perspective, this is PPR. Through the first 10 games, he was tight end 35 with a staggering 5.3 points per game. Over the last five games, he was a tight end one. 21.4 points per game over the last five weeks of the season. He was 4.6 points per game higher than Travis Kelsey or George Kittle over that stretch. 4.6 wow. points per game higher than either of those guys over those last five games. And over that stretch, he would have been the wide receiver two only behind Michael Thomas. So, no, I'm not saying oh. Tyler Higby's going to come out and be, you know, 21 points a game in 2020, but he doesn't even have to get close to that. If he gets 75% of the way there, he's going to be the tight end one. The Rams last season had the third highest number of targets to the tight end position, and that was after only really featuring po the position in the last five games. There's 121 vacated targets between Brandon Cooks and Todd Gurley. I know some of those Gurley targets are going to go to the running back Cam Akers, Daryl Henderson, but all the all the targets from, from uh, Brandon Cooks are not going to Van Jefferson. They're not going to Josh Reynolds. They are going to Tyler Higby, and he will be wow. the number one tight end in fantasy. I'm grabbing him everywhere, and no one can stop me except Steph <laughs> or any of you guys in my league that are listening to this. Please do not take him in front of me in drafts. <laughs> Well, I don't think I will. You have him right now in your projections at uh, the tight end five. I have him at the tight end seven. So it looks like you'll be grabbing him a little bit ahead of me. But, man, you blew my mind with that target number. I mean, 11 targets a game is like Michael Thomas level uh, when we're looking at it that way. So uh, you actually changed my perception there on Higby a little bit. We'll see if that 12 personnel really is the way that the Rams are going right. to go this Who knows season. how McVay is going to come out. Like, if it, Here's the thing. The, the risk-reward on Higby is so good because – Look, if McVay comes out and they kind of shift back to the old model of their offense, I think Higby does have standalone value at the tight end position. You can put him in there. Sure. He might not be one of those elite guys, but he's going to be startable. But if they come out with that same blueprint of 12 personnel, you have literally potentially just won your league because you now have a guy in the Travis Kelsey, George Kittle caliber that you got super late in drafts. That's that's true. And right now he's going overall at the 74 spot in drafts. You're talking seventh, eighth round there. I believe in our mock we ran, we got him in the eighth. Uh, and I, I just saw this as well. They have Gronk over Higby at, at the tight end seven, which I give me Higby over Gronk all day. Thank you. <laughs> just looking at that. Uh, just wanted to throw that out there. But no, that's I, I know Tyler Higby is a my guy. I'm sure you're going to continue to hype him up as we go into oh, the yeah. season. And it's certainly for good reason. But I'm going to give you my last take here, and it's about A.J. Green. Uh, I think he could finish in the top 10 in 2020. That's Whoa. my bold prediction. I and mean... it essentially comes down to this. Look, look, look. It essentially comes down to this. Everything we've ever seen about A.J. Green being on a football field has been absolute dominance. We have more evidence for why Green should be great when he's healthy than not. And, and 2020 is the year essentially Green burned a whole season for – uh, essentially, so this team could tank and you could have a better quarterback. <laughs> and, and the hype is real. Joe Burrow is in town. The Bengals have the best quarterback they've had in a long time. And a lot of guys have Joe Burrow projected near 600 pass attempts. I have more at the, the 560 range in my projections, which is, you know, again, we're not trying to be hot takey at all on those projections. But 560 is a ton of passing volume. But regardless, everyone, including me, believes Cincy will need to throw the ball a lot to stay in games giving Green plenty of volume opportunity. And if A.J. Green comes back and he's the same old A.J. Green we're used to, he could be a wide receiver one easily in 2020. Listen to some of these stats. In 2018, he was on pace to be the wide receiver 11. So here's his average stat line with Andy Dalton. Five receptions, 77 yards, and he scored six touchdowns in nine weeks. Wow, in 2017, like Green finishes the wide receiver 10. In 2016, before he went down with injury, he was on pace to be the wide receiver 4. In 2015, he was a wide receiver 8. If Burrow really is that good, and Joe Mixon plays the way a lot of people are expecting him to this year, Tyler Boyd, who everybody loves, we love him as a, as a late you know, mid-round uh, wide receiver option. We took him in our mock draft we did lately. If he remains efficient and slides back into that wide receiver two role or even a 1B role, and John Ross can stay healthy to spread the field, sheesh, this Bengals offense <laughs> could be nice. And they did have the 20th 
O-line, uh, pass blocking grade in 2019 per football outsiders. But now the Bengals have tw their 2019 first round pick, Jonah Williams, who is back healthy, ready to go after rehabbing a shoulder injury last year. And we already mentioned on the show how great Joe Burrow is under pressure. His passer rating actually went up when the pocket was collapsing in college, which is just it's unprecedented. So if things fall the right way for A.J. Green, there is a very real world where he's the dominant receiver we've seen every other year of his career, and he is a wide receiver one. Uh, now, that's the shot that wow. you're going to have to take because, you know, we know Green's health situation. But uh, honestly, there's a lot worse that you could do late in your drafts than, than A.J. Green. Yeah, I mean, think about last year. People took him in the fourth, fifth round, and he didn't play a single snap. Steph, while I'm giving you my rebuttal, you might not have it pulled up. Maybe you do. Can you have A.J. Green's ADP and some of the names around him? Um, yeah. Can you get those pulled up? I'm just interested to see the kind of names going in his range to see if I'd be willing to take a shot on Green. But I love what you said. Like, there's no reason to believe that if A.J. Green – the big if is if he can stay healthy. If he stays healthy – like he's going to be, he's going to return on value right now. I have him as my wide receiver 20, which I'm actually surprised I had him that high, but wow. at this point in his career with an upgraded quarterback, like you said, in Joe Burrow, there's no reason to believe he can't get it done. All we've ever seen from him. I remember several years ago was like AJ Green or Julio Jones. And those two guys were always kind of like in the same tier at the wide receiver position. Julio obviously kind of took that next step forward, but AJ Green was not far behind. He has had trouble staying on the field in the last two seasons. But for me, if he stays healthy, I 110% agree with you that he can and will be a wide receiver one if he plays 16 full games in 2020. Yeah, even if he plays 15 or 14 games, I, I think he could still get There's there. There's a shot. Right, yeah. right now at his ADP, he's going at the – let me make sure this is PPR. So, yes, it is. Uh, he's going at the wide receiver 28. Uh, I have wow. my rankings at the wide receiver 30. Uh, and you have him at 21. I mean, essentially, the, the question is his health. Um, you know, that's just that's a, that could have to be a risk you're willing to take. But that could be a league winning pick. Imagine if you grab A.J. Green uh, in the call it, you know, seventh round and right. you end up getting a wide receiver one from if, that. I think that could be fantastic value if he hits. Uh, and some of the names around there just wanted to, to bring those up. So Tyler Boyd is actually just a, a three spots below him at wide receiver 31. So Tyler Boyd or AJ Green, that's that's a question that we can answer. What do you think, Alex? I'll take the shot on AJ Green. I think Tyler Boyd does have standalone value and really good value this season. But look, if you're looking at a, like, if we're drafting this guy to be our flex, why not take AJ Green? If something happens and AJ Green gets hurt, you can stream guys in your flex. Steph and I, uh, I'll plug it again. Listen to our deep shots of the week during the season. We started guys like Steven Sims, Russell Gage, Darius Slayton last year. Guys getting 20, 30 points a week based on matchup, based on maybe an injury in front of them in the depth chart. So flex for me is a position I feel like I can piece together. Give me A.J. Green in the flex. If he stays healthy, he does have that potential to return on that value. And if he doesn't, I'll figure something out. So real quickly, some other names here right around A.J. Green's ADP right now. Uh, Debo Samuel right behind him at wide receiver 29. Jarvis Landry at wide receiver 30. Um, even some above him. Look at Terry McLaurin at wide receiver 27. I think we'll both take McLaurin over A.J. Green every single day of the week. But now look at some other names here. Devontae Parker, T.Y. Hilton, Stephon Diggs. I think you can certainly do worse for, for your wide receiver three or four. You have flex name that you're looking at as an option week in, week out. And, and if he hits... I mean, he's got, if, if he hits, he'll be on championship rosters, no question, because he'll be you know, on, the, on the fringe wide receiver one and range. And so will Joe Burrow. And so will Joe Burrow. <laughs> and so will Joey Burrows. But, Alex, I think that checked all the boxes here for our bold predictions. I'm sure there's going to be a lot more back and forth on a lot of these names as we reach the season. And again, guys, we're just looking at, you know, not things that we're saying we we're predicting to happen, but ones that certainly could in 2020. Alex, I think this was a hell of an episode. I had an absolute blast recording this one. Anything else before we sign off? Man, this was so fun. I can't wait to see what happens with some of these takes. I'm, I'm sure there's going to be one or two of them that we just like wish were never released to the public on the <laughs> internet because they're so bad. But hopefully there's a few of these. I mean, they're hot, but hopefully we can help win people leagues with these picks. Hopefully, Steph, you or I can, can make some 
um, draft decisions based on, on these, you know, hot takes we have for these guys and they can pay off for us and a lot of our listeners. One last thing I'll say, like, I, I don't know if it's the hot takes or what, but my room has turned into a sauna. I think these takes are getting a little too hot. I'm glad we're signing off. I'm sweating up a storm right now. I'm going to have to go jump in a pool or something because we just absolutely, you know, I need a fire extinguisher. This has been a lot of fun. I, I'm just so hyped up for the season. We're closing in. Absolutely cannot wait. Hey, it's, it's almost July. That's that's about the time where some of the drafts kick off. And then it's August, which is pretty much season. We got preseason. We got drafts happening. So we're almost there, guys. Thank you all so much for listening and watching. Again, if you like the show on YouTube, give us a sub. It means the world to us. But thank you all so much for listening and watching. And we'll see you next time. Peace.